the evolution of relationships with life to understand the, the evolution of the genetic code. So this is what I mentioned a moment ago. I'm just getting ahead of myself. So Wolves expected the translation machinery had to evolve in steps with selection acting on the mechanism speed and accuracy. He's looking at for an optimized code. When does the code become universal? And that's what led him to microbial phylogenetics. So this is what I, I think I've, ju I've just said. We don't need to look at this. He wants to trace uh, the life back to creatures that he calls progenotes. And I'll talk about the progenote a lot in a moment. And he's, I think the, to understand the progenote concept is to understand most of molecular phylogenetics. And I have to tell you, you know, that molecular phylogenetics is a big field, and people take the technology that was invented to do it, but they don't understand the concepts or where they came from. And I know that from experience. Um, so these are the reasons. He thought ribosomes are served at the core of organisms. These are the essential characteristics that all organisms would have, highly conserved. He starts off by questioning two basic assumptions that underlay the prokaryotic dichotomy. And it was that assumption that I think we were all educated with, which was that two of them. One was that prokaryotes pre preceded and gave rise to eukaryotes. And that prokaryotes themselves stem from a common ancestor, itself prokaryotic. And we all thought that, you know. It seemed, it seemed natural to assume morphologically that there was something called a prokaryote that led to a eukaryote. But Carl questions that immediately. And that's exactly what Edouard Chaton meant in 1925, too. And that's his trick um, from a prokaryote, cyanophysate, and spirochetes lead to eukaryotes. But Willis changes that. Already in 1970, before he begins the sequencing work, he writes a book called The Genetic Code. But unlike, comes out the same year as, as Watson's book. The difference is, is Wells' book is steeped in evolution. Steeped in evolution. Wants to understand the evolution of the genetic apparatus. In 1970, he writes a paper, The Genetic Code in Prokaryotes and Eukaryotes. And he argues that the split between eukaryotes and prokaryotes was much, was much more ancient than biologists had assumed. And that prokaryotes did not give rise to eukaryotes in the accepted sense. But there were two main lineages, and they had diverged much earlier from, non, from a non-prokaryotic lineage. And what gave them a heads up about it was the tRNAs. The tRNAs of eukaryotes look very different than those of prokaryotes. So right away before he begins his research, he has this very interesting, for me, counterintuitive sense. You know, when I read the progenote paper that he wrote in 1998, I was blown away. And that's when I wrote the will. I said, who is this man with this incredible um, iconoclastic way of seeing the world? So he thought that these two, these two lineages would come from another lineage that was, in the th that was in the throes, or a state, that was in the throes of developing the translation apparatus. There'd be no phylogenies in that circle. There'd be no phylogenies in that circle. And that's the problem to know. The question of chloroplast and mitochondrial origin was solved by Woes using 16S with chloroplast and by Linda Bonin for Doolittle and Mike Gray. Linda Bonin was Carl's, um, she's now a very well-respected molecular biologist, she was Carl's um, technician, and uh, her husband got a job in my own hometown of Halifax in Nova Scotia uh, and at, uh, at Dalhousie, so when, he, when she went up there, Bo said, we well, should drop in and see my friend for Doolittle, who was from Urbana, his father was a painter, right? and brought up in Urbana, knew Carl since he was a student. <laughs> they used Wills' technology to show that chloroplasts were cyanobacteria, mitochondria, or alpha probiobacteria. And that really plants it. It was done. By 1983, Mike Gray writes his paper in which he argues the basic question of the bacterial ancestry of plasties and mitochondria seems finally have to have been settled. And it is. It's done. In 1977, Wills announces another startling thing. Everyone knew Marvelous was really important. Was, you know, read The Origin of Cells, you know, The Origin of Eukaryotic Cells, that's a really important book. Knew about symbiosis, he was into it right from the beginning, deeply. And this goes back to some correspondence that Bruno and I had. But in 1977, Woes and his postdoc, uh, George Fox, write a, a paper in which they argue for a third form of life, the archaebacteria. What Woes had done is he looked for signatures. He did this based on about 11 nucleotides, I call it, I call it a kingdom based on a, based on a molecule. It's not based on a molecule, it's based on about 11 nucleotides. So what he did, and everybody thought he was out of his mind. So he would look for the signatures in prox, 
prokaryotes, look for them in yields, and say, okay, I've got those down. I've got those down. All prokaryotes have this signature in their uh, small subunit ribosomal RNA, and all yields have, have this signature. So I know what those are. I know what a prokaryote and eukaryote are. And all organisms subscribe to that signature. And then he looks at these methanogens. And these methanogens lack this signature. He went back to uh, Ralph Wolf in Urbana, Illinois, where he, he was and argued, uh, Wolf, I don't know what these things are, but they're not bacteria, they're not prokaryotes. Uh, one other thing I should mention just sociologically about Wolf is when he came from, he was one of the original code crackers, um, you know, um, working at General Electric, and then he went to the Institute Pasteur as a, um, for a session when things didn't work out at General Electric in Schenectady, and then when he was offered a job in Urbana, Saul Spiegelman came to institute, at the Institute Pasteur. Those are heady days when the messenger, around 1962-63, the messenger was being discovered. So Saul Spiegelman came through, was looking for a molecular biologist at Urbana. When Woz, so then a year later, uh, Saul invites uh, uh, Carl to uh, Urbana. The dean shows up, very smart man, and uh, offers Woz a position with tenure immediately. They want to make him a professor. He goes, I'm not a professor. I've never taught a course. You know, was a very bad teacher. Not a good teacher. But, um, but it was important to get tenure because now he can make, pose all these high risk questions. What is a young man doing using 16S ribosomal RNAs when the, the world thinks he's mad? Most people in his department think he's out of his mind. And he sits there and burns his mind out, his brain out, looking at sequences and goes home with them in his head. When Doolittle phoned up and told him what the sequence for mitochondria was, Carl said, I'd, we'll, we'll just tell it to me, read it to me. And Carl had them all in his head. I said, oh, okay, I know what that is. You know? So it was a really weird way of looking at the world. It's looking at the world in a very abstract way, right, in terms of sequences. So the first creatures um, uh, that were seen as belonging to the archaeobacteria were the methanogens, and these were strange organisms that were uh, classified in all sorts of different ways. Wolves bro uh, brought them together in one group, and these were found in the guts of rumens and swamps and so on. The other group that it soon followed were salt-loving halophiles. They were known for rotting salted fish. Then there were extreme thermidophiles, found in, in smoldering coal mine refuse piles. And Rose reconceived, all of them had the same non-prokaryotic signature. So he reconceived these things as ancient organisms at the dawn of life, and he called them the archaebacteria. And it turned out they had, he was worried that they had phenotypic properties that were going to match his 16S uh, signatures. And it turned out that the walls of the only positive feat characteristic that Stanier and Deuteroff and Edelberg gave to the prokaryote was that their walls possessed peptidoglycan. Well, these creatures, the walls lacked peptidoglycan. The lipid membranes in them were very different than uh, bacteria or eukaryotes. The transcription enzymes, this was done in, in the United States, I should mention. Rose's work was not treated well, but in Germany it was. With Otto Kandler, who was an amazing man, and, and, and Zillig, and Stetter, and Carl Stetter. And these people really did the molecular biology, the transcription enzymes, and they came in, that was a clincher. So the enzymes, the transcription enzymes, of the archaeobacteria are different than bacteria and eukes. This again, since this is ancient, he's finding his creatures where he's watching the divergence of the translation apparatus. Right? The life as we know it today evolved three times. And the, uh, the viruses of the, of the archaeobacteria were different. So this he has in 1970. It was very easy, seven years later, to come up with this conception. Right, when he sees it. So he's tracing it back to the progenote. The progenote is a state where these <coughs> somewhat cellular organisms, half cellular, were in the throes of evolving the genetic code. He doesn't know what these things are. And in 1980, he publishes a paper in Science, he always called it, of course, Bond's Big Tree. And this was a mind blower. Nothing like this had ever been seen before. Three domains coming up from a common a ancestral state, the, uh, the state, the progenote. He doesn't, he knows that, that eukaryotes, the chloroplasts, and mitochondria the, um, are symbionts, or suspects there. People still criticize the paper, claiming that data was in India. And, but he, and he's also not sure in this paper whether the eukes, or wholly chimeric. Maybe they're not a distinct lineage. Maybe they're from some fusion event. And again, uh, Lynn's work was really important. This is the uh, discussion I had with Bruno about um, symbiosis and the progenome. 
Right. I, you know, Stephen Gould wrote a book in 1989 called Wonderful Life. It was a really great book. But in it, he, he, he mentions symbiosis on one page. And he says, now turning to the quirky side of evolution. Mitochondrial chloroplasts are symbiotes. Yeah. And that's how it was perceived. And so Wolf saw that, you know, and says, you know, this argument that these chloroplasts and mitochondria are symbiotes are treated as exceptions. So this is a beautiful letter he writes to Emil Zuckerkandel in 77, arguing for why he needs his progeno concept. But Zuckerkandel could understand everything else, but couldn't get the progeno. Then the penny dropped when Wolf wrote him this beautiful letter. But this is just part of it. Endosymbiosis seems ad hoc. It needs to be excused today, just like my needs need to be excused. But when, but when progenote versus prokaryote is recognized, one could, could no longer take this narrow and misleading view of endosymbiosis. Endosymbiosis becomes an aboriginal property of the progenotes, not a acquired property of prokaryotes. God, I can't type. The ancestor has no cell wall. This evolves separately in typical uh, bacteria and eukaryotes. Endosymbiosis then suddenly becomes an interaction that is widespread and diverse. What we now take to be endosymbiosis is only the tip of the iceberg. Endosymbiosis, symbioses have been a major force in evolution for over three billion years. So he's into it, on the same page as Marvelous with respect to symbiosis. As if Lynn would argue that the bacteria arose through symbiosis. Because her question is not the origin of the genetic code. That's not. Usually stories about the origin of life started with some self-replicating entity of some kind and it was sort of just smudged over. In 1990, Wolf decides to get rid of the word bacteria and call the uh, archaebacteria the archaea. The reason he does that is for political reasons. In 1990, genomics starts up, whole genome sequencing. Wolf and, and Gary Olson apply to do an archaea, an archaebacteria, and they, they, the grant gets turned down. You know why? Because the, the genome people said, well, we've already done one bacteria. You know, we've already done one pieces. So the idea was, you've seen one, you've seen them all. They're all the same, right? So Wolf says, okay, we have to get rid of this word bacteria because people aren't understanding the depth of the microbial world. And part of that, part of that was to recognize the three domains, that there's huge depth in there. There may be other domains. No one pays was looking for a fourth one, you know. There may be other things we didn't, no one knew. The word, so he wants to get rid of the word bacteria as a strategy. Let's call them the archaea. And that came out in long correspondence with, with Otto Kandler. Where domains come from is was a political decision. Wolves didn't want any words that, uh, that implied conquest and domination. And um, so he's very, very sensitive to that, you know. Very sensitive character. Went to medical school for two, two years and two days and uh, was assigned to the children's ward. And um, he, he couldn't stand seeing sick children. So he went back into this world. So they're very sensitive to this kind of language. So the best they could come up with was domains. They thought that was as neutral as they could get, because there's no escape from social relations, right? Later on, it's my turn that into empires, you know. And so this was the three domains um, of 1990. It's then that taxonomists take note, uh, note, because this is a formal, a formal taxonomical, taxonomic proposal. Canada was a good taxonomist. So they knew all the rules of taxonomy. They read them. They said, we're going to make a formal a proposal in PNAS. And that got everybody's attention. They recognized, though, in that same paper, they thought there'd be many kingdoms. They say, we will not at this time address the matter of the individual kingdoms within domains, with the exception of the archaea. For the other, suffice it to say that there will be numerous kingdoms within each domain, and their formal structuring will require a more detailed analysis than is possible here. We anticipate that such an analysis of the eukaryo will preserve the kingdoms planted animalia and fungi with the last somewhat restructured to reflect new molecular insights, and will replace the protista with a series of kingdoms, corresponding to the various ancient protistan lineages. For the bacteria, we expect that the majority of the described phyla uh, will deserve elevation to, king, uh, to kingdom ranks. So it's either the other kingdoms. They, in the original three kingdom proposal of the Archaea, they called them Ur-kingdoms. Ur-kingdoms, they're like super-kingdoms, right? then later domains. So he's recognizing there's going to be lots of kingdoms, lots of things going on in this microbial world. So for Woes to, uh, uh, Woes is always accused of being a Cladus, and he never was. But the argument is, is for him, it is really important to understand uh, the debate between he and Lynn. 
Uh, for Carl, genealogy was primary, just as it was for Darwin. It's lineages, it's bifurcating lineages. You follow genealogy. You, uh, groupings could be paraphyletic. That is, you know, yeah, you lose information if you put birds um, with reptiles. It's not a good idea. Let's keep them as, uh, in, in, in a separate file. But you can't cross lineages. You can't cross lineages. And this becomes a heavy-duty issue with the prokaryote concept. It wants to get rid of the word prokaryote for political reasons as well as evolutionary reasons. Because uh, prokaryotes had the stigma, oh, they're just prokaryotes. You know, some sort of junior eukaryote that we don't have to care about. And, and archaeobacteria had the same sort of connotation. The tree was rooted in 1991 with bacteria on one branch. Um, where's, my, where's my tree? I thought I had a tree in here. Maybe I, it should show up in a moment. But when the tree is rooted, you have bacteria on one lineage, and then you have uh, um, archaea closer related to the eukes than it is to bacteria. Right? Which they suspected, because there's a lot of dialogue about that for years, whether these things are uh, uh, closely related to the eukes. The three domain proposals, of course, contradicted the prokaryote eukaryote dichot dichotomy, and it contradicted the five kingdom scheme that Lynn was promoting. Classical evolutionists hated, you know, this new molecular phylogenetics. They hated it. You know, they, when, when, when molecular biologists, you know, talked about the double helix and then cracking the code by 1962-63, you know, there were polemics in science with Meyer and Drzezanski writing in saying, you know, there's more to biology than that molecular biology. You know, there's all this diversity. And these molecular biologists, you know, they don't care about evolution. And evolution is big, you know. Then when the molecular biologists came into evolution, the classical evolutionists said, get the hell out. <laughs> we want any, not they're going to molecularize our field, but this kind of stuff that's highly technical, highly technical field to do it. So it's not well accepted by classical evolutionists. For classical evolutionists, species were real. Ernst Meyer, species were real things. I mean, interbreeding group, closed, isolated gene pool. But kingdoms weren't. They're a matter of convenience. He, he considered them a largely a matter of utility, and he said the kingdoms are a matter of taste whether you call somebody a kingdom or not. But they're not serious. But it's exactly the opposite for people in the microbial world. Today we know there's, no one knows what species of bacteria it is, but king, like people think the domains are real. Right? So it's switched a little bit. So this is Meyer. Species are real, but not kingdoms. Uh, in the growth of biological thought in 1982, 1,200 pages that book is at least. Uh, bacteria mentioned on two pages. I'm not saying there's two pages devoted to bacteria, but they are mentioned on two pages. And pro protozoa on two others. All bacteria were in one kingdom, the Monera. He recognized the fourth kingdom for fungi. He said a kingdom for protozoa is a matter of taste, not science. But he thought it was better for information retrieval. He thought classifying should be for utility, like books in a library. And given that the literature on protozoa was separate from the other literature, maybe we should give a kingdom status. But he really didn't care. Until three domains was. Uh, came out because that just said no. It was a deep microbial world. Then the classical evolutionists got very upset because they were saying there's something really deep under there, a lot of diversity. So Meyer changed his mind in 1990 and argued that prokaryote eukaryotes were domains. Later, he re preferred the word empire. Protists were too diverse to be recognized um, it, a, as a kingdom. He thought they should be a subdomain. Archaea, he gave the rank of a subdomain. But he still argued that taxonomy was a matter of degree of modification, and that the degree of modification trumped genealogy. So he had these long polemics with woes, and this is a paper about the PNAS, arguing that pro you cannot, uh, no one would believe that prokaryotes and these archaea that you call them and bacteria have anywhere near the degree of diversity as the great morphological diversity that separ separates a giant sequoia you know, from an elephant. I mean, these are real morphological things, but this is microbial world. Forget about it. I mean, and please don't tell me. So he writes, all archaebacteria are nearly indistinguishable. Well, they are, because this world's a world of the eye of the beholder, right? That's why that bit is, it's going on the bush. Very romantic world. You can see why this way of seeing things would upset something. It's a very abstract place. You're bringing in this whole microbial depth. And don't forget, classical evolutionists, and I know some to this day, didn't accept anything about evolution unless there was a fossil record for it. So I don't believe any genealogies unless they have a false record. That's why the evolutionary synthesis was really based on the last 500 million years of evolution. He said, even if one took all the prokaryotes as a whole, it doesn't reach anywhere the size and diversity of eukaryotes. Well, the answer to that is, well, how do you know that? They haven't been studied yet. <laughs> Let's have a look first. Microbial phylogeneticists 
has so far described only about 200 archaea species and only about 10,000 uh, eubacterial species. And within eukaryotes, he argued, there were more than 30 million species. There were more than 10,000 species of birds alone, of course, hundreds of thousands of species of insects. The problem I have with this, and when I put a biologist hat on, is I guess my would say if there's one kangaroo left, you'd still have to call it a mammal, but don't, put, don't call it a, a marsupial. Do you know what I mean? And so there's something wrong with that. But it was part of his theory of taxonomy, he thought he cracked that. It was all about balanced populations and so balanced taxonomy. Lynn opposed microphylogenetics. She hated it. She hated it. And early in 1968, before anything about three domains comes up, anything about the archaeobacteria, anything about molecular phylogenetics based on nucleotide sequences, when things are based on amino acid sequences, in 1968 she writes this. It's a beautiful piece. Taxonomic schemes should help us to make predictions. When we are told that a giraffe as a mammal, we infer that the female suckles her young. Without knowing anything else about us or pseudomonas, except that it is uh, dicotledonous, one can deduce that it photosynthesizes and that it has true leaves, roots, stems, flowers, and many other traits. These concepts, so obvious to the great evolution, such as Simpson, have been often ignored by many biochemical evolutionists who tend to disregard whole organisms, the objects upon whose population selection in the natural environment acts. So right away, Lynn's world is a, is a world of morphology and diversity in that sense, but not, and, and classifying in terms of grades, almost like a numerical taxonomist. And this is a big debate, there's still are people, he's not alone arguing this. This is the same way I think it, that um, Ernst Meyer would argue later on. Well, the sends her a paper when the halophiles came in as archaeobacteria. He sends the paper on the archaebacteria, and Lynn writes back, I always had the, the whole letter about it. I'm away from home when I was writing this thing up. And uh, so this is all I had for my book. She writes to, to, to Carl, the typical Margot Stella, the archaeobacteria in the very commas, question needs a discussion. So King is in turmoil. She's, uh, Lynn and, and uh, Ricardo Guerrero write a paper in the New Scientist in 1992. I'm almost wrapping up. Is it okay? Uh, give me five more minutes. Um, Writing, the meaningfulness of any phylogenetic tree as a guide to evolutionary history depends critically on what and how many characteristics were used to construct it. These would include appearance, anatomical organization, development, mode of nutrition, metabolic pathways, gas emissions, pigments, and so on. Well, there was no middle ground in those regards. For the new molecular phylogeny that came up, that made actually no sense whatsoever. You might as well just be speaking Greek. Because only from molecular phylogeneticists, nucleotide sequence and, uh, sequences, mm -hmm. and amino acids through which one could quantize uh, or quantify uh, uh, evolutionary relationships made any sense. They were the only signals, molecular phylogenetic signals, not that stuff. That was all phenotypes. Markless uh, modified her taxonomic scheme, scheme in 1992. She recognized in 1992 that there were two super kingdoms that she called prokaryota and eukaryota. And archaeobacteria and eubacteria were sub-kingdoms of the kingdom Monera. So that was a concession. She started to recognize some aspects of this molecular phylogenetics. She also modified her, uh, her theory of the symbiotic origins of, of uh, eukes. What happened was, so she's reading the literature on molecular phylogenetics, hates it, but has to learn it, and knows there's good things there. And one thing that came up was that the eukaryotic nucleus had bacterial genes in it, and they'll be expected because the mitochondria would have transferred them to the nucleus. But there were other bacterial life genes that didn't seem to have any obvious mitochondrial functions. The informational genes in the nucleus were all archaea like, They're really closely related to, to the uh, archaean translation uh, machine or information machine. Right? So people argue, a lot of people argue, that the eukaryotic nucleus is chimeric, that it was formed. From a relation, from a fusion event between an archaean and, and, um, and a uh, bacterium, and so some argued as well that there was a third kind of entity that was part of that fusion event, and that was the chronocyte. And this is the argument of, of Hyman Hartman and uh, Alexa Fedorov that there would be other uh, genes in there, and they would represent the cytoskeleton, and there were no obvious. Um, genes among the bacterial world, extent the bacterial world that corresponded to those genes. So they, they said there was an, now an extinct form of bacteria that became the yuke. 
the eukaryotic lineage. And so there'd be a fusion event between those three, and so that's the eukaryote equals A plus B plus C. The second argument was that the eukaryote is basically talking about the nucleus. This is, this is who's the mother, who's the engulfing mother. Right? Um, so this one, the argument is that the eukaryotic nucleus is a fusion event between an arcane and a bacterium. Bill Martin argued that that bacterium was in fact mitochondria. Now you didn't need anything else. It was mitochondria fusion right away that caused the, 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 and the, and the nuclear membrane was formed afterwards and so on, which is really part of the outside membrane of the cell anyway. Lynn argued something different. And this is where she switches. I think she switches for a different reason. So she puts spirochetes first. That maybe the cytoskeleton came first. And the reason for that also is there's a new kingdom proposal of the Archaeozoa by Cavalera Smith, and these are organisms like Giardia that seem to that seem to be ancient and lack mitochondria. So you thought, well, maybe there were organisms before mitochondria. Today that data, whether or not there are organisms that lack mitochondria, is, is highly debatable. But here she changes from this uh, um, model to one with spirochetes coming first, then uh, mitochondria and, and, and chloroplasts. And that, I think, is informed by molecular phylogenetic methods. But then there was another problem that Lynn and many others had with bacterial phylogenetics, and, I, and I'm hoping Jim's going to talk more about this than what I am. And this is lateral gene transfer. Everyone knew, including Jim's mentor, Bill Hayes, right, who's, who's the subject conjugation, knew there were different ways that bacteria could transmit genes. So you do it through conjugation, through a pillus, really understood a little bit anthropomorphically, I think, what they really think is going on in that pillus. But and then through transduction, viral transduction, and through transformations that bacteria can pick up DNA from the environment. But no one knew, so that was all known by 52, but the bacteriologists wanted, I think, and I might read this literature, they wanted bacteria to conform to the neo-Darwinian synthesis. Bacteria was always left out of the synthesis, so it was seen as the, 